Hope you all had a great Halloween, my dear friends. Thanks for joining me again so soon after. Thought you might just be a bit creeped out after all the stories everyone was sharing yesterday. Well, you're here, and that makes me happy. And I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. Davis, one of my favorite collaborators. And we've got a juicy little story for you this evening. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've been doing things that are a little bit more extreme than I normally would. So I've decided to make Wednesdays my extreme creepin' day. Not every Wednesday will have a gruesome, gory story, but I'll try and keep them to those days. And forewarn you too. Beginning with tonight's adventure. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear friends. Because we've got a story for you. And it goes something like this. My dad was a rich businessman. He owned his own restaurant called The Cannibal Cuisine. Yes, I know the name doesn't really sound all that appealing, but the food there was to die for. I had always admired my father. He worked hard and he never stopped. However, I found it very odd that he never spoke of his childhood, and every time I would question him, he'd just brush it off or change the topic of conversation. I just couldn't understand why such a successful businessman would never want to talk about his upbringing, especially with his own son. That was until a week ago, when he was lying on his deathbed. My father looked me straight in the eyes, and I could almost feel the excitement that he was feeling. Son, there's something you need to know, and I don't think you're going to like what you hear. I looked at my father with a confused expression, plastered across my smooth baby-like face. He had just told me that I wasn't going to like what I was going to hear, yet his eyes were filled with excitement. I was now intrigued more than I had ever been. I took a deep breath and spoke. Well, I guess I should settle down for a long story then. My father smiled as I took a chair from the hallway just outside his ward and placed it next to his bed. I took my father's hand and he began. Picture this. A teenager, age 15, curled up in a ball in the corner of his attic. Waking in fear every day for his father to get back home from the pub, only to be beaten till he was black and blue, then sent to bed as though nothing had happened. Well, I had just that kind of upbringing. My mother died when I was only ten years old and my father struggled to cope with the responsibilities that came along with being a single father. I don't blame him. I don't blame him at all. I was a very troublesome child and I didn't make things any easier for him. I'd stay out late into the night with my friends. We'd drink alcohol in our local park. I smoked and I stole things from the corner shop. So, due to all this, my father turned to alcohol to get him through the massive amount of pain he was feeling. But alcohol only made him violent and he started to take his anger out on me. What would you have done if you were me? Would you just deal with it because you were 50? Or would you, with a wide grin, Slowly push a knife through your father's beating heart as he slept, and watch as the life was slowly drained away from his seemingly innocent face. What could possibly drive me, an innocent 15-year-old, to do such a thing? Especially to my own father. Well, the agonizing wait to indulge in my curiosity. That's what. My mum had always said I had unique taste buds. And boy... Was she right? I remember the intense satisfaction I felt as my father's body fell limp, and he lay there, lifeless. I slowly pulled the knife out of his body, and watched as the warm, thick blood came gushing out of him, covering his brand new white bed sheets. I was expecting a putrid smell to come from him, but instead there was just a stink. Metallic smell coming from the blood. My father paused as I heaved at the thought of him ever doing that to anyone. From what I knew of him, he was always busy, but he didn't seem like he could do something like that. He never showed any emotion. His face was always just expressionless. Something was telling me that he enjoyed killing his own father, but I wasn't going to ask questions. Not yet. 
There was no escaping this story, however. I was intrigued. I wanted to know what kind of monster my father was. I grabbed a paper bag from underneath my dad's hospital bed just as a safety precaution in case I got sick and then allowed him to continue on with the story. It was coming up to 9pm and I was getting hungry for the taste of karma in the form of my father's flesh. So, carefully, I dragged his lifeless body down to the basement entrance and threw him down the long, twisting, never-ending staircase. I then started to clean up any evidence of the murder. I began with his blood-stained sheets and clearing up the trail of blood he'd left behind. I gathered up the bed sheets and brought them out into the garden to burn them. Then I grabbed a cloth from the kitchen and got to work, scrubbing the wooden floors until they were completely clean. I must say, I did a fantastic job of it. I didn't worry about cleaning the stairs to the basement, as no one knew we had one. And anyone who did come and try and fight my father, well, they could join him. Next up, I had to clean the knife that I'd murdered my father with. I clenched the handle and carefully took it to the kitchen to rinse. I turned on the tap and ran the blade under the hot water, watching as my father's blood turned the water bright red and slowly trickled off the knife. Once I'd finished... I dried the knife and placed it back in the cutlery drawer, as though nothing had happened. It was now about 11.30pm, and it was time to start preparing my dinner. I grabbed a hatchet from the kitchen, then proceeded down the long, twisting, bloody stairway to the cold, dark basement, where my dad's body awaited me. As I stood over him, a sudden feeling of guilt and dread washed over me. But those feelings soon subsided as I decided where my first cut into human flesh would be. My decision was to start with his face. My father, believe it or not, cared a lot about his appearance, and his face was the most important thing to him. So this would be the perfect place to start. I plunged my knife into his soft, delicate cheek and started to cut myself a nice, substantial chunk of flesh. I held it in my hand like a trophy, and started to drool as I thought about how good it would taste when it was cooked. I stared at it in awe, as the beautiful aroma of raw meat began to fill my nostrils. Trying to contain my excitement, I headed up to the kitchen to cook this sweet bit of meat. I grabbed a frying pan and poured some oil into it. As I waited for the oil to heat up, I decided to bag up the rest of my father's body and put it into the freezer. When I'd finished cutting every bit of meat from my father, all that was left were his bones. They were to be ground up and used as a fertilizer for my plants. I care a lot about the environment, and my father's bones would be a great contribution as food for the plants. I started to prepare my bit of flesh for cooking. I sliced the layer of skin off and cut the chunk of red, juicy meat into smaller, thin slices, and threw them into the pan along with some onions and peppers. Surprisingly, the meat didn't take long to cook, and it was ready to eat within half an hour. The smell of the freshly cooked flesh was just bliss. I was very excited to try my new creation. Very excited indeed. I walked through my kitchen to the dining room, where I set my plate down on the table. I stared at my beautiful creation for a while, before taking a seat and beginning to make my first cut into the tender, succulent meat. Slowly, I raised the meat to my lips and started to chew. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. If there was a way to describe heaven, this would be it. The flavour of the meat itself was just incredible. But as the flavours of the onions and peppers came in, things only got better. My taste buds were sent into overdrive, and I devoured every bit of my dinner until there was nothing, not even the slightest crumb left on my plate. <laughs> This was the best way to celebrate my 16th birthday. Now, 
satisfied in the fact that I'd just eaten twice my body weight in amazing food. I washed my plate and went to bed. The next morning, I awoke to the sound of silence. I felt no remorse for what I'd done the night before. No remorse at all. Groggily, I started to lift myself out of bed. I threw on my arsenal kit and headed downstairs to make a full English breakfast. I sat down in front of Matelli and began eating. Ugh, the meat just didn't taste as good as my father. But I was saving that meat for something good. And, just as I was about to turn my TV off, an advert for a new cooking competition came on. The competition was called The Perfect Meal and would be broadcast across the world. Six contestants would take it in turns to present a dish that they'd created within a set amount of time to two famous chefs. The chefs would then taste the meals and decide who would be crowned the winner. The winner would get to open their own restaurant and they'd win five million pounds to spend however they wanted. This was too good an opportunity to miss and this competition wouldn't be happening again, ever. So... I took my chances and applied for it. Luck was really on my side that day, as the age restriction was for people who were aged 16 or over. I filled out my details and received an email saying that they would get back to me within the next 24 hours if I had won a spot on the competition. I didn't sleep that night. I waited up all day and all night, staring at my inbox for another email to come through confirming my spot on this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It was around 7.45 in the morning, and an email finally came through. The email contained all the details that I would need to know to prepare myself for this amazing competition. The email specifically said that we needed to bring our own ingredients, as none would be provided for us. That was no problem for me. I had everything I needed. The vegetables and the flesh. All that was left to do was buy one special ingredient to season the flesh, and that was ghost chili powder. This would make my creation taste ten times better. The day of the competition came around, and believe it or not, I was very nervous. I was the youngest contestant on the show, and I was going to have to impress my two favourite chefs. Gino De Campo and Gordon Ramsay. I didn't want to screw this up. I knew that everything had to be perfect for me to win. As soon as the cameras started rolling, all my nerves subsided, and I was determined to make history with my beautiful creation. We had one hour and 45 minutes to cook and prepare our meals. I only needed 45 minutes, so this gave me a full hour to work on the presentation. The time came to present our meals to the judges. I was the last contestant to be judged. They signaled for me to come over so quickly, I just sprinkled some ghost chili powder over my pork and then made my way up to the table where the judges stood. They both looked at each other and smiled. What have you got in front of us, young man? Gordon asked in awe of my beautiful presentation. Well, I took a deep breath and began. You have seasoned pork with crispy roast potatoes, fried onions and fried peppers. What a very odd combination. I'm intrigued, Gino smiled. They both dived in with their knives and forks, making sure to get a bit of everything onto their tiny forks. Gino was the first to give feedback. He turned to face me and cried. Ah, this has got to be the most beautiful dish I have ever tasted. The potatoes are crispy and full of flavor. And that pork, that pork is like nothing I have ever tasted. It's beautiful. You have done an amazing job. Well done. Gordon surprisingly smiled and nodded in agreement with Gino. Yes, the meat itself is full of flavor. And just when you think the meal can't get any better, the flavours from the peppers and the onion come through, along with the spice from the ghost chilli. This is a truly beautiful dish and you should be very proud of yourself. I went to rejoin the other contestants while we waited for the winner to be announced. 
As I took my seat, all the contestants were congratulating me on my dish and on the comments that the judges had given me. I smiled and thanked everyone. For once in my life, I felt like people cared about my feelings. I felt, well, I felt loved. I'd never really experienced this feeling before, but it felt good. It was time for the judges to announce their winner. One by one, a contestant would be sent out of the room. The last person in the room would be the winner. So, it got down to where there were just two of us left in the room. Myself and a woman in her early twenties. My heart started pounding as the suspense was building up. And the winner is... Cairo! Gino shouted with grave excitement. I couldn't believe it. I'd won the competition and I was the youngest contestant there. I turned to face the woman who was making her way to the doors. She turned around to smile at me one last time, and I smiled back. Then, the judges handed me a cheque for five million pounds, and stood beside me for a photograph. So, Cairo, what's the secret? What did you do to make that pork taste so good? And what's going to be the name of your new restaurant? Gordon asked. I took a deep breath cleared my throat and said, Well, Gordon, a good chef never reveals his secrets. Both judges laughed. And as far as the name of my restaurant goes, well, I've decided to call it The Cannibal Cuisine. Why such a sinister name? Gino urged, captivated by my creative choice. Well, I began... I've always been a fan of horror, and I love the idea of being unique. I mean, it's not like you come across a cannibal cuisine every day, right? We all laughed, and I prepared myself for the opening day of my restaurant. That day came quicker than I thought it would, but I was excited. I put on my chef's outfit and drove to the restaurant nice and early, so I could get myself familiar with this beautiful building. I noticed two things immediately that would be great assets to me. A large soundproof basement and a large freezer. Although these two things would be great assets, I couldn't help but wonder why they'd made my basement soundproof. Did they know? Were they trying to help me commit these sinister deeds? I don't know. But one thing's for sure. I was very happy. These would make my job much easier to perform. Now, I know you're probably wondering what I did with my five million pounds, aren't you? Well, I hired a hitman named Jacob to work alongside me. He was surprisingly cheap for a hitman, but I wasn't complaining. He was the main reason my restaurant was successful. We've worked together for all these years. He'd do the killing and I'd do the chopping. People would always tell us what an effective team we were and how they never wanted us to close down because the food was absolutely amazing. My father looked up and I could see that his facial expression was that of a happy old man. <laughs> so, this is my legacy to you. Will you do me a favor and keep the business <laughs> alive? <laughs> My father laughed maniacally at his own pun, and I knew he hadn't made the story up. I was now faced with the toughest decision of my life. Do I carry on my father's business? Or not?
<laughs> Sorry for the dreadful Gordon Ramsay impression. I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> well, what did you think of that one? Comments below, please. Like I said, a little bit more gruesome and a bit um, of a dodgier subject matter than I would not normally go for. But I'll always let you know from now on, so don't worry. If it's not for you, you know I'll see you again real soon with something more to your tastes. Well, big thanks to Mr. Davis. Make sure you go check out his channel. He also has fantastic content. He makes videos regularly and they're all brilliant. Always a pleasure to collaborate with him. Well, that's all from me for tonight. And you know what? I'll see you all again real soon. Until then, sweet dreams.